Neural Development is a new journal, and I guess the first thing to say is that nobody knows uh, what shape it will take. I'm very optimistic for a couple of reasons. Um, one is the open access model is one that I would say is supported in principle by all biologists and um, has taken a little while to really reach its full flower but is at this point getting there. So probably open access will be the predominant way of delivering scientific information within a few years and journals like Neural Development that are committed to that goal and that have started early will be in a very good position. Um, Another reason for optimism is that it is an online journal and that's something else that I would say everybody acknowledges uh, is the model for the future. But we're all, and I include myself, um, tied to paper products and there is uh, remaining a feeling that a journal that doesn't come out in paper isn't quite real. But I think we have to acknowledge that that is the wave of the past. And, um, there will be online only journals coming to prominence and journals like Neural Development that are there early uh, in this new wave uh, will be well positioned. The advantage then is that um, Neural Development allows the full story to be told and so it will, I think, get around what's become a big problem with uh, print journals. Another reason to be optimistic is that neural development is already a big field that is underserved by current journals. There are journals that cover cell biology generally um, and neurobiology generally and those journals I'm sure will thrive because there's a great need for people to read outside of their comfort zone. But many areas have very high quality specialty journals in which important information that other developmental neurobiologists uh, need to see or what, what, whatever the field is, uh, are published. One thinks of, for example, Journal of Cell Biology, Journal of Biological Chemistry. Um, and there hasn't been that venue for neural development. That is, there have been a few specialty journals, but uh, way below what's needed to cover the field. Another factor is that it's a growing field. And as it uh, expands, it changes. Over the next few years, I think one is going to see a lot more work on neural development related to behavior, to take just one of many examples. An area where there's already a lot of work, but it'll only increase, is translational aspects of neural development. As we learn more and more about neurodegeneration, about regeneration, about neurodevelopmental diseases like autism, like schizophrenia. There's the realization that the keys to these problems are going to be found to a large part in studies of ordinary neural development or normal neural development. So I think there'll be a lot of work coming out. There already is, but there'll be more work coming out of developmental neuroscience with an eye to translational uh, applications and neural development will be, I hope, a good place to put that work. One of the terrific things about online journals is that there is no limit uh, to the story you can tell. I think many of us, I, I for one, have grown very weary of presenting essentially a long abstract in a paper and all of the facts that uh, would need to be used to buttress the case uh, relegated to supplementary material. And so that um, limitation isn't there uh, in the journal. That comes with an obligation. I mean, I think authors and editors will need to pay attention to the fact that the reading, uh, the capacity of readership to digest information is finite. Um, but at least the possibility is there to use the journal to tell a story that needs to be told to include the facts that need to be included um, and then use one of a number of mechanisms to get facts that might be of great interest to the authors but less to the readers uh, moved off to the side. The more research is done in the third world, the more open access will be necessary. 
because already it's very hard for laboratories outside of um, China, Japan, the United States, and a few European countries to have access to the scientific literature. And that becomes, it is a crippling problem, and it becomes a more serious crippling problem as more and more countries try to launch research enterprises. The same is true to a lesser extent at institutions within rich countries. There are richer institutions. I happen to be at one. But there are many institutions that can't afford uh, site licenses or subscriptions to journals. And journals are becoming ever more expensive and ever more numerous. So I would say that the number of institutions that will be able to have access to a broad range of journals, enough research to really make researchers feel supported, is going to go down for sure in percentage terms and will probably go down in absolute terms as research funds thin out and each institution has to make a choice of what it can support. It will probably support salaries uh, above library subscriptions as it should. So open access is an answer to that conundrum. I'm urging my colleagues to publish in neural development. Um, other labs uh, in my institution, at other institutions, and, and of course people in my own lab. Um, I think that there are some publications that are of interest to the scientific community as a whole or the neuroscience community as a whole. I would say that for developmental neurobiologists, at least two-thirds of what we do that we love, that we think is important, is going to be primarily of interest to other developmental neurobiologists. And I think for that work, neural development is already a good venue and is poised to be the best venue. I went to graduate school in neurobiology. I went to the neurobiology department at Harvard Medical School, which at that point was maybe the only, certainly one of the few neurobiology departments that existed. And so it was a wonderful place to be. You got to see uh, all of the neurobiologists because there was nobody else, nowhere else for them to go. Um, I did my thesis actually working on invertebrates, on moths, but uh, already in the development of the nervous system, particularly the development of sensory neurons. And then I actually went away from science for a year, but with the intention of coming back. I did come back. And I did a postdoctoral fellowship that was kind of co-mentored by Jack McMahon um, and Zach Hall. And I'd gotten fascinated by an observation that had been made by somebody else in Jack McMahon's lab, but not pursued, which suggested that the extracellular matrix might have information important for synapse formation. And I was already interested in synapse formation. This seemed like a wonderful uh, opportunity to be involved in something really interesting, uh, potentially important, and so that's what I did and started working on synapse formation and essentially have not stopped. Then after uh, postdoctoral work I went to Washington University. Um, really I've been so lucky, it was a wonderful place to work, very collegial, many good neurobiologists, supportive, uh, easy to work at. And I was there for well over 20 years um, doing research, teaching some, but in a medical school. And like most medical schools, it had a uh, fairly low teaching load. And then just over two years ago, I moved to Harvard to um, partly have something new in my life, to have a change, and partly for the challenge of starting a center for brain science. Um, which is at Harvard College rather than at the medical school and which has the aim of bringing together biologists with people in psychology, uh, behavioral sciences, and physical sciences. And that has actually much less of a developmental and more of a systems neuroscience flavor. So my role in that is partly as administrator and partly with the aim of using some of what I've learned in development to tackle systems issues.